today at the National Press Club, the Treasurer, Wayne Swan. As the government finalises details of its carbon tax, the Treasurer will discuss the policy in the context of Australia's economic reform and reveal Treasury modelling on economic growth. From the National Press Club in Canberra, Treasurer, Wayne Swan. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Press Club for today's National Australia Bank Address. I can't recall the last occasion, if indeed there was one, when a guest speaker had the opportunity to return to the club uh, within a month. That's what's happening today. Uh, of course, with the budget bettered down, the government's now turning its attention to other key issues, including the carbon tax. Last week here, we heard from uh, the government's climate change adviser, uh, Mr Gungano. Today, of course, it's the Deputy Prime Minister. Please welcome Mr Swan. It's great to be here. It's good to see uh, some of my parliamentary colleagues here, Greg Combay uh, and Bill Shorten. And it's good to see all of you here today uh, for this very important discussion. It is uh, pretty unique to be back uh, so quickly and so soon after a budget because that speech a month ago and the theme of the budget was all about Australia making the most of the tremendous opportunities which are presented by the enormous change that is underway in our world. Recognising that rather than being on the periphery of the global economy, in coming decades we will be much closer and closer to its centre. Now the impact of this is most vividly apparent today in the mining boom, but in the years to come it will become very apparent in many other areas of our economy. Now, as I said when I was last here, to accept that challenge, to make the most of this opportunity, we do need to modernise our economic infrastructure, increase our capacity and invest in the education and training of our workforce. But I think, crucially, we also need to price pollution so that we can drive new investment in clean energy. And really, that's what I want to talk about today. I start from a conviction that no first-rate, first-world economy will be anything other than a clean energy economy into the future. Just like the global economy was propelled forward in the decade to now by rapid development in communications technology, success in the coming decades will be powered by cleaner energy innovation. And the only way, the only way to drive investment in this technology is to, put a price, is to put a price on carbon pollution. And of course, only a market mechanism does the job. You can't have a first-rate modern economy and a carbon price, or you can have a first-rate modern economy and a carbon price, but you can't have neither. As Treasurer, I refuse to let this country become an old world, high polluting, technological backwater. There's no excuse for this as a forward looking country in the most dynamic region in the world. Now each of us who believe in taking action, including the many thousands of Australians who attended rallies on the weekend, has come to this conclusion in different ways. For me, having grown up on Queensland's Sunshine Coast, I'm driven by the impact climate change could have on our standard of living and our lifestyle. The sort of impacts outlined in the report in the coastal communities that Greg Combay released on Sunday. But what really inspired me in this area was a meeting I had five years ago, which I described at the time as the most important public policy discussion of my life. Now, as Shadow Treasurer, I was drawing up alternative economic policies at the time and I went to the UK to talk with Gordon Brown and Nicholas Stern about the groundbreaking climate change report that Sir Nicholas was about to hand to the UK government. Stern convinced me then, and I remain convinced today, that we have a narrow window of opportunity to act and that the costs of doing nothing far outweigh the costs of building a low pollution economy. Now, the five long years that have elapsed since that meeting 
despite all of the ups and downs, have not dissuaded me one bit. As Treasurer, I see a price on pollution as the next crucial frontier in economic reform. It's the type of progress that future generations will speak of in the same terms as the big reforms of the 80s and the 90s. It is the most cost-effective way to decouple economic growth from emissions growth, building a low pollution economy by making dirty energy relatively more expensive and clean energy relatively cheaper. Now, the consequences of doing nothing are very, very clear. The science is convincing, the threat is real, the economic and environmental benefits are tangible, and the need for action is imperative. As the Prime Minister says, this is not something that gets easier the longer we leave it. Ignoring it is akin to refusing to visit a doctor until the pain is overwhelming and the treatment is more drastic. As Ross Garneau reported in 2008, world GDP would be 8 per cent lower by 2100 in a world with climate change compared with a world without climate change. Our own real GDP could be around 6 per cent lower over the same period and real wages would suffer. Without global action, we will experience severe water shortages and higher temperatures, and the Murray-Darling Basin could lose half of its annual irrigated, irrigated output by the middle of the century, with consequences for food prices and the cost of living more broadly. Extreme events, permanent changes to local climate, and loss of parts of our coastline could severely damage our water supplies, electricity networks, ports, homes, and commercial buildings. As global growth slows, the engines of our prosperity would switch down to second gear as demand for our mining resources falls as well. Overall output from Australian mining would be 13 per cent lower by 2100, with a poorer world demanding less, coal and other mineral prices would fall. Tourism would also be hit harder by fewer overseas visitors due to widespread environmental damage and a weaker international economy. So as one of the nations likely to suffer more than most others from unmitigated climate change, we can't afford to sit on our hands. Today, instead of trying to cover every aspect of the debate or going over all of the ground that was covered by Ross Garno last week, I want to make three key points ahead of new material which will come from the Productivity Commission and from the Treasury. The first point is that so much is going on around the world that it's ludicrous to argue that we are moving in isolation. Acting now does not mean acting alone. The real risk here is actually falling behind. 